you very, was you, what you say, was you deeply, profoundly disappointed in you when you, when you didn't make that team at the Detroit Lions? I, I was, I was disappointed to tears. Let of me course. tell you, I'm going to tell you why you, you know why you didn't make it one thing? <laughs> Remember you asked us to pray for you? That's one time I didn't pray for you. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell you why, because I didn't want them to break you up. Well. And the only thing I could see and visualize, my boy on the stretch of the first time somebody hits you, carrying you out. Remember you told me when you trained with them somewhat, they found they hit. I said, well, they naturally be easy on you. I said, but wait till those opponents come in there. You know what I'm saying? No, I can take it. You know, <laughs> it, uh, I did good. I went through a month at uh, Eastern Michigan, and mm -hmm. they had a pretty, pretty tough bunch of guys up there. And uh, we hit every day. You know? They really did. They hit you. Did, yeah. You didn't feel they lighting up on you? Well, they, I don't know. <laughs> Marvin Pence Gay Jr was born on April 2nd, 1939, to his mother, Alberta Gay, and his father, Marvin Gay Sr., in Washington, D.C. He was the second oldest of five children, and he described his upbringing as poor. He grew up on the southwest side, and he nicknamed the area where he came up as Simple City because he said it was half city and half country. But it was clear early on that Marvin had a gift for music, because at the age of four, he would often sing songs with his dad. He would sing, his dad would play the piano. So they had like, you know, a pretty good relationship. But like I said, his dad was a minister and they went to a Pentecostal church. It was called the House of God. And they followed the Old and New Testament, but they followed it to a T. They were very, very strict with it. And this would cause Marvin to endure brutal beatings from his dad for anything that he did wrong. And he will use the Bible and God as the reason for the beatings. Um, actually, Marvin Gaye described living with his dad as like living with a king, uh, a very peculiar, changeable, cruel and all powerful king, you know. And he also said that he probably would have killed himself if it wasn't for his mom. Because his mom used to console him through the beatings and through everything that his dad was putting him through. And this was later confirmed by his sister because she said that, yes, Marvin did get the brunt of the beatings from his dad. But through the beatings, Marvin would continue to sing. And at the age of 11, after starring in the school play, his music teacher told him that he should pursue a career professionally in music. And once he got to junior high, he ended up joining the Glee Club. So you could just kind of see his love for music growing and growing. And once he got to high school, that's when he started to join different doo-wop groups and things like that, kind of like honing his skills musically. But also during his high school years, it, the beatings got worse from his dad and his dad would belittle him, tell him he couldn't sing. His father would kick him out the house. And I, I think part of the reason for this is because as Marvin was getting older, he was becoming, you know, more handsome and he was like a ladies man. He could sing. And I think his dad started to kind of resent all of these these quality traits that that Marvin had, because a big part of their relationship was his dad's sexuality. His dad was a closeted homosexual and hit Marvin knew that. But the thing that was confusing to Marvin was. His dad would beat him for not following things that are in the Bible. But Marvin would also see his dad dress up like a woman. And I think since Marvin was the only one who would speak out to his dad about his hypocrisy, I think that's part of the reason for the beatings. And I think that's what really, you know, destroyed their relationship. And this will cause Marvin to want to get away from his volatile home life. So as a way to do that, he ended up joining the Air Force. But see, Marvin's plan was to go to war. He didn't want to just join the military and kick back. He wanted to see some action, but that didn't happen for him. They had him doing things like laundry and just cleaning up and Marvin got tired of it. So basically what he did was 
acted like he had some mental issues and got kicked out of the military on a general discharge. But once he got back home, he ended up getting together with a good friend of his named Reese Palmer. And that's when he formed his own quartet called the Marquis. And they would perform like around D.C. doing local shows and things like that. That is until they met the legendary blues singer Bo Diddley, who ended up getting them on his record company. But after the group made a single and it didn't go nowhere, they end up getting dropped. Right after this, Marvin would meet a man by the name of Harvey Fuqua, who was the lead singer of a group called The Moon Glows. And under his tutelage, Marvin Gaye's group changed their name from The Marquis to Harvey and the New Moon Glows. And this is when he moved to Chicago and started recording for Chess Records in 1959. And this is also the same time that he did his first lead vocals on a song called Mama Lucci. Um, but from there, him and his group pretty much just worked as session singers for bigger artists like Chuck Berry. But due to lack of success in 1960, the group would break up. And Marvin Gaye, he would actually end up moving to Detroit and he moved there with Harvey Fuqua because he had started his own record company called Tri-Fi Records. And he signed Marvin as a session musician, meaning that he would just play the drums for different artists that were on the record company. That is until Marvin performed at a Christmas party that Barry Gordy was in attendance at. And Barry was very impressed by Marvin. So he went to Harvey and asked him like, yo, who's this young singer that you have? And eventually they struck a deal and Harvey agreed to sell part of his interest in Marvin Gaye to Barry Gordy. And that's when he signed to Tamala Records and it would later be known as Motown Records. Now, it's also alleged that Marvin Gaye was able to get this contract with Tamala due to Barry Gordy's sister, Anna Gordy, and saying that she pulled strings to get Marvin signed. And why would she do that? Well, because she began to like Marvin Gaye and she wanted Marvin Gaye. Even though she was 17 years older than him, she really wanted to be with him. And eventually that's what happened. And in June of 1963, the couple married and Marvin ended up writing songs about Anna as well on his album Stubborn Kind of Fella. He wrote a song called Pride and Joy, where Marvin said that he wrote that song because he was just head over heels in love with Anna. He said, I just wrote what I felt about her and what she did for me. She was my pride and joy. But even though the marriage started off on a beautiful note, Unfortunately, it didn't stay that way for long because it said that Anna Gordy was a very sexually promiscuous woman and a very sexually free woman. And she would often try different sexual acts with Marvin. But Marvin was a lot younger than Anna and he just didn't have the dominance that Anna wanted. And this would cause Anna Gordy to just straight up start cheating on Marvin right in his face. With anybody around Motown, really anybody anywhere, because that's just the type of personality she had. And Marvin Gaye had more of a laid back demeanor, so he wasn't volatile like that. Even though there were times that he blew up in that relationship, for the most part, he just let Anna do whatever it is that she wanted to do. But even though the couple was going through a tumultuous and toxic relationship, Anna Gordy ended up announcing that she was pregnant with Marvin's kid. But see, the thing is, Anna Gordy couldn't have kids. So it was eventually found out that this baby came from Denise Gordy, Anna Gordy's niece. And Denise Gordy was only 15 years old at this time. And it's said that Marvin Gaye was actually the father of this child. Marvin Gaye III, even through everything that he was going through in his marriage with Anna, Marvin would continue to record music. And in 1964, he made a duet album with Mary Wells of the Supremes. Even though he would later be known for working with Tammy Terrell, that was actually his first official duet album. But he really began to rise in 1966 when Ashford and Simpson began to write songs for him and Tammy, starting off with Ain't No Mountain High Enough and following up with Ain't Nothing Like the Real Thing and You're All I Need to Get By. I mean, you, you know how Tammy Terrell and Marvin Gaye had a, they were like musical soulmates. Marvin Gaye, he really loved Tammy. Like it wasn't nothing sexual. He just loved her energy. She, he loved the way that she made him feel. You know, it, it wasn't like they were actually together. They just had a really good bond as friends. But unfortunately, in October of 1967, while performing in Virginia, 
Tammy Terrell collapsed in Marvin Gaye's arms as he was performing and she was rushed to the hospital and they later found out that Tammy Terrell was suffering from a brain tumor and uh, this man this just sent Marvin into a tailspin he was out of it like it seemed like everything that was good in his life turned bad you know and even though he ended up releasing another hit single with Heard It Through the Grapevine he got even more depressed because he felt like he wasn't creating his own music because that song was wrote for the Gladys Knight and the Pips and he felt like he was just Barry Gordy's puppet and this will cause Marvin to just become disillusioned with the whole music industry. So he left music altogether and he actually went and tried to play professional football for the Detroit Lions. But obviously that didn't work out. And he became even more depressed when in March of 1970, Tammy Terrell finally died from brain cancer. And it said that Marvin Gaye put himself up in a hotel and just stayed there in seclusion. And he was on the verge of actually taking his own life with a gun to his head until Barry Gordy's dad, Pops Gordy, went there to save Marvin and just tell him that you have too much to live for. Please don't do this. And Marvin gave in and didn't kill himself. And this would return Marvin to making music. And this is around the time where he made the classic What's Going On, which was inspired by all of the anti-war rallies that was going on during this time and police brutality and the civil unrest that was going on in America. But see, the thing is, Motown did not want to release this album because Barry Gordy felt like the political views on the album would hurt the Motown image because they had a very pop friendly, a very polished image. And he felt like the music that Marvin was making would cause them to lose support. And this caused Marvin Gaye to go on strike. He wouldn't record for Motown at all. And eventually Barry Gordy and Motown gave in and decided that they would release the album. But Barry Gordy told Marvin Gaye, if we release this album and you lose your audience, you're finished in the music business. So it was a gamble for Marvin, but he took that gamble and he won because that album ended up selling two million records. And he had songs on there like Mercy, Mercy Me, Inner City Blues, and uh, along with all kinds of other hits. Y'all know how classic that album is. And then the following year in 1971, Marvin Gaye was signed the most lucrative deal by a black music artist in history when he signed for one million dollars. And with this newfound success, Marvin Gaye began to grow more confident. You know, he was getting older. He was getting more recognition, more money. So eventually he didn't want to be controlled by his wife, Anna Gordy, anymore, you know, because she had pretty much controlled his career up until this point. And eventually in 1973, the couple end up separating. But Marvin Gaye would find another love of his life that same year when he met a young woman by the name of Janice Hunter. Now, at this time, she was only 17 years old, but that did not stop 34-year-old Marvin Gaye from falling head over heels in love with her. And it's said that the song Let's Get It On was actually inspired by a young Janice because they met while he was recording that album. And it's alleged that the first day he met this 17-year-old girl that they became intimate. Now, see, when Marvin met Janice Hunter, who would later be known as Janice Gay, he viewed her as like pure, like an angel, innocent, untouched. And he looked at himself as dirty and sully from everything he went through in his life, how he was always dominated by everybody. He was dominated by his dad. He was dominated sexually by his ex-wife, Anna Gordy. It's even said that his uncle molested him as a preteen. So Marvin Gaye wanted to use Janice as his submissive. He wanted to be in the dominant role for once. And the way that he would insert this dominance was by no longer viewing Janice as a pure, young, innocent angel. He started to view her as a sex object, somebody who was there to be dominated and to do whatever he wanted to have done sexually. I mean, he would have her participate in orgies, swinger parties, and he also had a thing with watching Janice with other men. Now, let me clarify this. Not that she would go out on her own and cheat, but Marvin Gaye would send her out to cheat with other men and not just any men. Some of them were his rivals. Like it's a story that he set her up with Frankie Beverly from Mays and actually watched them engage in sex. 
And it's also said that he set her up with R&B singer Teddy Pendergrass. But that's not the end of the madness, because it's also said that after Marvin Gaye would send her out with these other men, that once she returned, he would usually beat her and tell her that, yes, I told you to go out and do these things with other men, but you wanted to do them anyways. And he would physically abuse her. And I feel like this all happened because Marvin Gaye was a tortured soul from everything he went through with his dad, everything that he had went through in life. And through all of the craziness of their relationship, they still had two children. In 1974, they had Nona Gay, and in 1975, they had Frankie Gay. And the couple would go on to marry in 1977, but by this time, their drug use was out of control. Both Janice and Marvin was using PCP, LSD, cocaine, free base, and that's pretty much what they spent their time doing, having orgies, fighting, and doing drugs. And it got to a point where Janice just couldn't take it anymore. And she also said that after she had her children, Marvin would start to insult her. Tell her she doesn't look as good as she used to look. She's not as young as she once was. And he doesn't like the way that her breasts look. Pretty much just anything to tear her down. And it got to the point where in 1979, Janice just filed for legal separation. If you want to get some insight on just how tortured Marvin Gaye's love with Janice Gaye was, it's a song that he made in 1976 called I Want You. And that was about Janice Gay. And in that song, he's basically talking about how he doesn't deserve somebody, how he wants them to want him. But he knows that they don't because they see who he really is. And that person was Janice. And that would send him into a very deep depression, along with owing the IRS millions of dollars. So what he did was put himself in seclusion once again by moving to Maui in Hawaii and not going there to live in paradise, but he went there to live in an abandoned bread truck. Yes, Marvin Gaye, one of the greatest, most legendary singers, made millions of dollars, was living in an abandoned bread truck. But when journalist David Ritz was able to track down a reclusive singer, that's when the world would get to see Marvin Gaye in his truest form. Because according to David Ritz, when he arrived to conduct the interview, Marvin was in women's clothing. He had on women's underwear. He had on a woman's robe. And Marvin explained to David that he wasn't gay. He didn't have an attraction to men. He just liked to wear women's clothing. And he liked the way that the women's clothing made him feel and I think that was kind of um, something that was going on with him because of what he saw his dad doing I think seeing his dad dress up as a woman and things like that uh, affected Marvin in a deep way and it got to a point where he just couldn't hide that internal demon anymore the journalist also stated that in his visit with Marvin he noticed pictures on the wall that Marvin had drew Pictures of women in different positions of bondage, women with gag balls in their mouth, women being tortured, just different states of sexual deviancy. He also explained in that interview of how he tried to take his own life by ingesting an ounce of cocaine in one setting. But he said that that didn't work and he said he really didn't have the courage to use a gun. He also talked about his bouts with depression and he said that he was a manic depressant. He was always at his lowest and he really felt like he wasn't loved. He felt like he was useless. But through all of these negative feelings that he had about himself, his talent shined through one more time. And that's when he left Motown Records due to a lot of contract issues and issues as far as the musical direction they wanted to take him in. And he signed with CBS Records and he would go on to make his album Midnight Love that had the classic single Sexual Healing. Now, this song would go on to be the biggest R&B hit of the 80s and spend 10 weeks at number one. And he also won two Grammy Awards for the Midnight Love album. And his popularity rose even more when he did a classic performance of the Star Spangled Banner at the 1983 All-Star Game. So once again, Marvin Gaye was back on top through everything that he went through. But unfortunately, it wouldn't last too long because his depression and everything, it, it started again. He went on tour in 1983, but it was just plagued by cocaine use, paranoia, illness, 
canceled tour dates and things like that. And it got to the point where Marvin just went right back into seclusion. But see, this time he didn't go back to Maui. He didn't go to some secluded remote hotel. He went back to where the trauma started. He went back to live with his mom and dad. And this would be a fateful decision in Marvin's life. Now, it's said that once Marvin moved back in, him and his dad would often have confrontations because Marvin felt like, well, he paid for the house, so he's the man of the house. But see, Marvin Gaye Sr. didn't look at it that way. He looked at it as, I'm still your dad. I'm still in control. So they would often bump heads. And it's also alleged that in some of his drug-induced rages, Marvin even jumped on his beloved mom. But see, on April 1st, 1984, they had one altercation that would be the final one because allegedly Marvin Gaye Sr. had jumped on Marvin Gaye's mom. And once Marvin intervened and beat his dad up, he left the room, went, sat down on his bed at the edge of the bed and just almost like he was waiting for something. And that's when his dad walked in with a gun and pointed it at Marvin. And Marvin just looked up at his dad, looked in his eyes. And his dad pulled the trigger twice. And when Marvin's brother Frankie heard the commotion and heard the gunshots, he ran to the room and he seen Marvin laying on the ground and he went to hold Marvin and try to save him. But Marvin just looked at him and said, it's OK, man, this is what I wanted. And following the death of his son, Marvin Gay Sr. would be charged with first degree murder. But those charges was later dropped to voluntary manslaughter after it was discovered that he was suffering from a brain tumor. So he ended up just receiving a six year suspended sentence and probation. And after Marvin Gay's funeral, his ashes were spread across the coast of the Pacific Ocean. And I believe that this last act, it, it just was to put Marvin at peace because he seemed to be a very tortured soul, but through everything that he went through, he was able to give us timeless, classic music. And no matter what personal faults he went through, he will forever be a legend, no matter what. And um, he was only 44 years old when he died, man. Rest in peace, King.